and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of the Blessed Month of Kiak. And so today we celebrate the birth of St. John, and we celebrate his nativity, and we also say Happy New Year. St. John is the greatest born of women. What a statement. When we think of St. John, what comes to my mind is to prepare the way of the Lord to make his path straight. And today, when we read <clears throat> that, we, that, that he will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. To prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. If that's not a worthwhile New Year's resolution, I don't know what is to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. What does that mean for us? We should not be surprised that these words ultimately refer to the heart. Christ desires to reign and to rule over his people by ruling their hearts. So we have to prepare the way of the heart, to straighten the paths of the heart, so that God can come to us and that we might be able to come to him. So we prepare the way of the Lord in the same way that the people prepared the way of the Lord so long ago when these words were spoken to them. We repent, we confess, and then we receive baptism or the washing away of our sins. <clears throat> of course, we know in the Orthodox Church, in the Orthodox faith, there can only be one baptism. So how, do we be, how can we be baptized again? St. Basil, the great, says that the second baptism is the baptism of tears. The baptism of tears. So we should pray and reflect on all of our sins. We should acknowledge that our sins have really separated us from God, who loves us, and who also separates our sins, separate us from our friends and our families. <clears throat> We need to understand that my sin affects more than just me. Sins can be very powerful, but God is more powerful by far. It's not even a contest. <clears throat> Sometimes we put God and the devil side by side as if this is the epic battle of good and evil. It's not, it's not even a contest. It's a shame that we put God at the same level as the devil, as creation. Earlier, <clears throat> I said, preparing the way of the Lord, making his path straight, if that's not a worthwhile resolution, I'm not sure what would be. So why should we start our new year with this type of resolution? <clears throat> because as Christians, we say that we desire to know God and to be his sons and daughters. This is what we claim. And the only way to make our desire a reality is through True, heartfelt, and even painful repentance. <clears throat> I came across this nice illustration. I didn't, I didn't come up with this. This is somebody else's work. <clears throat> Anytime someone wants to build a house, we think that the first thing that must be done is to prepare a foundation. That's not true. The first thing that must be done is to clear a path for the materials and the workers and the equipment to come to the construction site. The Lord Jesus will provide the materials, the workers, and the equipment, and he will even oversee the whole job. The materials are the sacraments that bring us the grace of God, especially Holy Communion. The workers are the clergy and our fellow brothers and sisters who minister to our needs and love us. The equipment is the church and all that is contained in her, her prayers, her discipline, her services, her hymns. All of that is provided by the chief architect and builder who is Christ our Lord. What is required of us is to clear a path for him to work. We have to give him space to do his amazing work. The work requires patience and time, and it requires us to genuinely struggle to keep the path clear and straight for the Lord. If the Lord is always battling for a spot on the path, we are bound to fail. <clears throat> 
But if we uproot the sins, especially the lust of our heart, he can do an amazing work in each one of us. And along the same lines, at the beginning of the new year, <clears throat> it's important to think about the year that has passed us. And we should do this with great gratitude to God for all that he has done for us, all that he has given us, even the things that we didn't want, all of it, the things that we would deem blessings and the things that we would deem a challenge or tribulation, all of it. He has really, truly blessed us throughout this last year and throughout our lives, if we really pay attention. St. John Chrysostom says, When you see the year coming to completion, give thanks to the Lord that he brought you to this period of years. Put your heart to rest. Count up the time of your life and say to yourself, The days move quickly and pass by. The years come to an end. We have already traversed much of the road, but that what noble thing have we done? We will not go from here empty and lacking all righteousness. The judgment is at the doors. Life presses on and toward our old age. As we look back at the year, we should have time to carefully, we should give ourselves time to carefully examine ourselves and our choices to see whether those aspects of our life really, truly glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. Or if our choices are just simply a mirror, a reflection of ourselves and our own desire. So looking back will be fruitful and balanced if we have this approach. Okay, Obuna, this all sounds nice in theory. <clears throat> okay, let's take a look. I want to pause for a second and pivot a little bit to reflect on perhaps a piece of debris that's on the road that needs to be removed from the path. Let's do a case study. Let's reflect on a gospel passage that should be familiar. The Lord tells us the kingdom may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Are we familiar with the story? The king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. It's a familiar story, I hope. One servant owed a lot of money to his master, and he begged for mercy, and the king took pity on him. He had mercy on him. He forgave the debt completely. And as a servant who was forgiven was on the way back to his own home, he came across his own servant who owed him a very small, trivial amount of money. How did he respond? The man who just was forgiven completely from the king. How did he respond? He became terribly aggressive. Very demanding of his servant. He showed him no mercy, but only cruelty and anger, and he threw him in prison until the debt was satisfied. Okay, Abuna, what does this story have to do with us? How does this relate to us? How does this relate to the kingdom of heaven? Our Lord tells us that the king is a symbol of God, and we each owe a great debt to God. It is a debt that we could never repay, even if we had all the money in the world. In fact, we know that our debts with God were forgiven and completely wiped away. What debt am I talking about? The debt caused by our sin. Humanity carried a great spiritual debt. We were imprisoned and enslaved by our own sin held bondage by death, have no way out. Yet, we were found by Christ, the merciful lover of mankind. And he paid the ransom for us with his own life and his own blood, and he freed us and he forgave us. 
Many of us have experienced this deep sense of generous mercy of God's forgiveness in our own lives. I hope. Maybe we've had moments when our own sin weighed us heavily, almost tangibly. We can feel the sin on us. And some of us experience it quite often. And so we go through this blessed mechanism in the church, this gift in the church, the sacrament of confession. Some of us take for granted. All of us, this is given freely to us as a sign of God's love through his, through his only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we have not felt that release of God's full mercy on us, then I'm afraid we're not doing confession correctly. He made us who are his creation and were formed from the dust of the earth to be higher than angels. So the Lord freely and generously and completely pours out all of this forgiveness on us. And as we acknowledge this fact, we are then forced to look in the mirror and ask ourselves if we have shown similar level of mercy and forgiveness on all the people in our lives, all of them. Father Alexander Schmemann of the Eastern Church, he said once, to forgive is to put between me and my enemy that radiant forgiveness of God himself. To forgive is to reject the hopeless dead ends of human relations and to refer them to Christ Forgiveness is truly a breakthrough of the kingdom into the sinful world. Some people in our lives have done us wrong. Spouses, parents, children, friends, co-workers. Humanly speaking, it's very possible to end up in a situation where you hurt others, whether knowingly or unknowingly or whether they hurt you knowingly or unknowingly. We always assume knowingly, but knowingly or unknowingly. And the pain can be real when others do us wrong. And this is especially true when they are people who might be close to us. How do we respond in our own lives? How do we respond in our hearts? Do we harbor a lot of ill will towards the people who have hurt us? It feels natural. It feels natural to do that. But God is calling us to do something higher, to be like him, to love with a godly love. Whatever it is that others have done to us, no matter how awful it may be, we are called as children of God to be more. We are called to forgive because Christ has demonstrated this for each one of us. We shouldn't be people. We shouldn't put people in the prison of our angry and resentful hearts because Christ has completely freed us. We are called to open the kingdom to the world around us. Even when others have hurt us or done us wrong, we have the ability to pray for them and to ask God to help them and to bless them. In our day, that might be seen as a weakness. But the reality is that what seems to be our weakness is transformed into our strength. This is the biblical principle that applies first and foremost to the cross. The cross makes one appear helpless and weak, insufficient. It makes one appear cursed and punished and dead. Yet in the case of our Lord, he turned the cross on its head to make it the ultimate sign of strength and victory. 
How important is it that we learn to forgive others? It's everything. It's everything. Our daily prayer to God the Father, which was taught to us by his only begotten Son, reminds us of this each time that we pray. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This sign of our acceptance and understanding of what God has done for us is found in our ability to freely forgive those who have hurt us. St. Mark the ascetic once wrote, the sign of sincere love is to forgive wrongs done to us. It was with such love that the Lord loved the world. In marriage, this is often the case between husband and wife. Regardless of who was right or wrong, I get it because I don't want to let it go. I don't want to let them off the hook. They hurt me. So I want to hold on to this, whatever this resentment is, because I feel like I get to punish them by holding on to it. So when you ask me to let go of it, they get off the hook. What is first necessary is to ask forgiveness and to actually forgive so that Christ can begin the healing. Instead of competing for justice, competing for personal rights, the husband and wife should compete to outshine one another in mercy and forgiveness. It is a great form of humility when you ask forgiveness, although you may not have done wrong, as long as you do it with the proper spirit and humility. What we're saying in effect is, I'm sorry for whatever I have done wrong, knowingly or unknowingly to hurt you. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And what is the ultimate pride and delusion when someone comes to you to ask forgiveness and you attach conditions to your ability to forgive them? or you refuse to do it. This is pride. Can you begin to imagine the sin that we've committed to God? Is God's love conditional? No, absolutely not. He pours out his mercy on his creation, on mankind, the pinnacle of his creation. So we have to learn to do a couple things, to approach others and to ask forgiveness of them and to also accept others with generosity when they approach us. Even before they finish their sentence, we give them a hug. This is the lesson from the father with the prodigal son. Even before he finished his sentence, what he was rehearsing to say, the father embraced him. If we can't do this with our spouses, if we can't do this with our family, no, we in fact, we insert words that they should have said too. We add to their speech. We need to cover, we need to cover each other. If we don't learn this, we're very far from the kingdom. But if we learn them, God will be near to our hearts and he will make his home in our hearts. This allows us to prepare the way of the Lord. This is preparing the way of the Lord to make his path straight, to forgive. Siblings, forgive one another. Friends, forgive. Children, forgive your parents. Parents, forgive your children. If people have offended you by their thoughts or their opinions or their way of life, forgive them. Because only then will you be open to receive God's forgiveness. You're standing in your own way. When we think that we're holding on to personal justice, we're standing in our own way. I pray that we take this seriously and approach it with joy because the Lord, our, our Lord Jesus Christ is teaching us out of his love for us. And he's giving us the road 
to have true peace in our lives. A swift entrance to the kingdom of heaven. And that's ultimately what we're preparing for. This is preparing the path. This is what it means to cleanse our hearts. To cleanse our hearts of that cancer of resentment in an uncompromising way. To allow space for God and what is holy. And then you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised by the way that God breathes new life into you and in your relationships. May the Lord bless the crown of the new year by his grace and his love towards mankind through the prayers of St. John the Baptist, the greatest born among women. And glory be to God forever. Amen. We magnify your